Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, I think we're in our third week here and talk about walking in the fear of the Lord. Uh, I don't have any announcements yet. We, uh, uh, we'll go this week. People might be asking about Bible study. We're still putting it on hold. We're just still getting adjusted with our, our move here in Camarillo. Uh, we're now in Camarillo, California. We're no longer in Ontario, in case you've been following us. Anyway, but our Bible classes are still on, on our website. We're going to pick up our Bible series soon. Um, anyway, uh, but here we are, uh, our third week, talking about walking in the fear of the Lord. Uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, uh, real quick, let's just uh, go to our opening scripture real quick to Psalm 36, verse 1, just to get things rolling here this morning. And David writes an oracle within my heart. Actually, I want to read this from the King James, excuse me. Um, one second. Let me talk over there. And it says, the, the transgressions of the wicked says within my heart that there is no fear of God before his eyes. The world says, the transgression of the wicked says there's no fear of God. I know the subject uh, walking, or the subject of the fear of the Lord is not a popular subject. Uh, even even among grace people, um, but uh, it's it's something that it's all throughout Scripture. We've talked about this. Jesus, it says that Jesus walked in the fear of the Lord. Paul talked about the fear of the Lord. Uh, the New Testament talks about the fear of the Lord. The, the, the early church it says they walked in the fear of the Lord, and they multi they multiplied. That's one of my key verses, and we're going to get there some more today. And uh, uh, but uh, we need to walk in the fear of the Lord. And the fear of the Lord is in dire need today, and very lack today. And I'm trying to, trying to tie this into with how does this fit even with the grace message? How does this fit with when, when we talk about righteousness? See, when we're talking about fear, we're not talking about dreading the Lord. We're not talking about performance. We're talking about honoring God. We're talking about respecting God. We're talking about uh, trusting God. And uh, those, I mean, those terms, honor, respect, are lacking desperately in the, in the church today, in the world today. People don't respect one another as, as they used to in families, in the church, in the modern friendships and whatnot. They don't honor, they don't respect them, uh, one another. I, I picked you back a few weeks ago on some things from Andrew Womack and how uh, people don't even keep their word today. People just so, or whatnot. And, and, uh, and the Bible talks about a lot about the field of the Lord regarding marriage, regarding employment, employers, regarding uh, our elders, and regarding uh, parenting and whatnot. We need to respect, we need to honor God, we need to trust God, and we need to trust and honor one another in the field of the Lord. And so, uh, and I titled this message, Walking in the Fear of the Lord. It's not just, uh, it's a walk, it's a lifestyle uh, that we need to embrace. And we've also talked about from 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, and I'm not going to go there again this morning, but we need to, the, the fear of the Lord will help us. In this New Testament, 2 Corinthians, Paul speaking, the fear of the Lord will help us perfect holiness. We're not holy because of what we do. We're holy because of who we are in Christ. Only the blood of Jesus can make anything holy. Nothing can make. Even in the Old Testament, even in Hebrews chapter 9, it says that even the law was sprinkled by the blood. The only, the, what made it holy is the blood of Jesus. Now, just because we are holy, just because we are righteous, doesn't mean we don't live righteously. doesn't mean we don't live holy. We live holy not to become holy. We live holy because we are holy. I'm going to get into a scripture uh, possibly next week as we, I think next week will be the conclusion of this series, but, uh, but, but we'll talk about how, uh, uh, more about that, how with holiness and whatnot, how the fear of the Lord uh, is, uh, uh, we'll, I'm, just, I'm just going to dig in that next week, I, might, I lost my train of thought on that. But we've been talking about the fear of the Lord, we need to live holy, we, and there's a, we need to, to perfect holiness in our lives. In other words, you know, as I grow closer in our relationship with God, I'm born of God because of what He's done and the, the salvation I receive by His grace. But His grace teaches us to deny ungodliness. His grace enables us to live a life free of sin, not a life still entangled in the sin that the grace delivered us from. And so there, there, there's, a, there's a growing process, there's a maturity process. There's a, there's a walk with God that perfects us into holiness. 
Uh, you, you know, anyone who has a, a, a sport, a hobby, or whatever, uh, something in some vocations, we didn't become veterans of some of the things that we do uh, overnight. For example, Olympians didn't become Olympians overnight. They, they have become, they have worked towards perfection in their sport and their athletic abilities through training, through experience, through even trial and, and error. You didn't learn to walk overnight. You didn't even learn to crawl overnight. Uh, we learned to sit before we learned to walk and crawl. But in the first time you walked, you fell down a few times. But now, if we, if, as adults, if you're still falling down every few minutes, then, you know, you might need to see a doctor, you might, something may be wrong. But uh, yeah, at the same point in time, I'm, I, I try to make a point, we're walking, and we're growing, and we're maturing in our relationship with God. And, and when we do that, there's a perfection that begins to come place. That makes sense. Uh, you know, a fruit, as it's sitting on the vine, ripens. It become, it, it, it's ripening to perfection. You don't want to eat that fruit prematurely. But, you don't, uh, but if you give it time, as it's abiding in the vine, there's going to be a perfection. You also don't want to pick it too late. You, there, 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 needs, there needs to be a time where it, it comes into perfection. Uh, and we do that by abiding in Him. As we walk in the Spirit, we won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. And uh, the me walking in the Spirit has everything to do with walking in the fear of the Lord. It has to do with honoring Him. It has to do with respecting Him, hearing His Word and His precepts. It has everything to do with trusting Him. And not just my own flesh, my own lusts and appetites. We also talked about a lot about trust. And the key verse is from the Father 3, 5, and 6, and actually beyond that, it says, The fear of the Lord is trusting Him with all of our heart. The fear of the Lord is leaning not on our understanding. The fear of the Lord is, is acknowledging Him in all of our ways, not being wise in our own eyes, departing from evil. Walking the fear of the Lord is health to our bones. It's healthy. And it's also, uh, we honor God with our first fruits, with our tithes, with our offerings, with our almsgiving, with everything that we have, our whole lives, our time, our energy, and our money. We honor God with everything I have because I'm His. I'm I am crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. I'm living this life as a walk, not just a talk, not just on Sundays, not just as a label, but as uh, in the field of the Lord, honoring Him and respecting Him as my Daddy, as my Master, as my King, and my Lord, and my God. Uh, we talked about from Proverbs 8, 13, how the field of the Lord is to hate evil, is to hate pride, is to hate arrogance, and is to hate the forward or the lying mouth. And uh, that bears false witness. But today I want to switch gears a little bit and, and I want to get to something a little more positive. Uh, not that the other was necessarily negative, but uh, uh, turn with me real quick to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. And I wanted to use this as a prelude to where I want to get to. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And the very popular passage of scripture, maybe not so much in the context of the fear of the Lord, but I want to use this again as a prelude to where I want to get to. But it says, and Luke is writing here, but you shall receive power when the Holy, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me again, <coughs> but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses, that's a key word I'm going to get to, you shall be witnesses to who? Me. In Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Luke and Luke says, and these last days, and how many of you know that we live in the last days? This is we live in the day where Jesus has already died, but buried and rose again. We live in a day where under grace. We're living in a day where the church is born and the church is alive. It's not a building, it's not an organization, it's not just an assembly, even though I agree with the assembly of the church. The church is a spiritual being, and it's a people. And even with this whole COVID and everything else, and, and, and the way we've done this, and I know churches are meeting again, but in everything we do, we are a church, not under an organization, a denomination, or even a building. We are a church. We are a spiritual being. We are born of God. He is the head, and we are the body. But it says that we shall receive power when the Holy Spirit, we are living in a day when the Holy Spirit has been poured out upon all flesh. 
as it says in, 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 the, in the book of Joel, and as uh, Peter uh, uh, quotes from on the day of Pentecost. But he says, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses. We are witnesses. We are not the judge, and we are not the jury. We are witnesses. When you have in a court system, when you have a witness, a witness only shares what they have seen or what they know. They only share their part of the story. They, they, they don't speculate. They don't make a judgment. They don't, they, they don't make a, uh, they're not the jury. They, they, just, they just give a witness. There should be a witness in our lives to our families, to our friends, to the world, to society, that Jesus is alive. There should be a witness. There should be uh, the fear of the Lord, the uh, respect and honor for God, uh, a, a, a trusting of God, a believing in God for the miraculous, a believing in God for healing, believing God at His word that by His stripes I'm healed, believing at His word that my God shall meet my needs according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. We should have such a trust, such an allegiance, such a, that's a, such a, such a, uh, 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 lack of better word, stubbornness, a, a steadfastness about us that we are trusting God. We are relying on God. We are, He is our God. That we, and we should be a witness. And a witness is powerful in the court system. When you have a, a, a witness, an eyewitness, of, for example, a murder, that is one of the strongest pieces of evidence, if I understand right, of all the shows I've watched, you know, of a witness. That's why a lot of these shows you watch, with, they want to kill the witness. Because they know if they kill the witness, they destroy the evidence. A, a witness is powerful. And you might not be a pastor, a missionary, a prophet, but you have a witness. You might not have someone else's story. You have your story. You might not reach everyone with your story in one sense, but you will reach someone with your story. Your, your witness, your, your life, your testimony, your witness is powerful. But your witness is not powerful if you are two-faced. Your, your witness is not powerful if you say one thing and live another. If you say you trust God, but you live in fear, that's not, that will destroy your witness. Am I making sense? When you say, God is my healer, but you go to everyone and every doctor before you go to God, that's not a witness. I'm not saying God can't use doctors. I'm not saying there's something wrong with going to a doctor. But we go to him first. When, you know, and there's, I can paint the picture with so many different things, finances, other things, our witness, how we treat one another. Jesus said, by your love for one another, you, people will know that you're my disciples. Jesus prayed in John 17, he prayed, Father, I pray that they be one, as you and I are one, so the world will know that you sent me. Our greatest witness to the world is how we treat one another in the fear of the Lord. Can I say that again? Our, one of our strongest witnesses to the world is not our religiosity. It's not how much we even can quote the scripture. And I believe in that. It's, it's how we treat and love one another. Jesus said it more than what our strongest witness to the world is how we treat one another. And do we do it because we feel like it? Or do we do it because we fear the Lord? I've shared before already in the series, Joseph was a strong witness to, jo to Pharaoh, to Potiphar, to the, the, whole, the, the, the jail keepers who, who made him charge. He was a witness. He's a witness to us of his faithfulness, his loyalty, his integrity, his fear of God. Daniel was, was a witness to King Darius. Daniel was a witness to, to, to us and, and even though his accusers and those, even those who plotted against him. Uh, David was a witness. 
Esther was a witness. The list can go on and on. Shadrach, <coughs> Meshach, and Abednego were a witness to King Nebuchadnezzar and the nation of Babylon, even in captivity, because they feared God and bowed down. Am I making am I making a point? Are you getting my point? I, mean, I know I'm making it. I just don't know if I'm making you're getting it. It's powerful. I believe, yes, a witness is also seeing the miraculous. You know, anytime people use this verse, and I believe in, in the gifts of the Spirit. I believe in seeing miracles. I believe in seeing healings. And it includes that. I'm not excluding that. But you know what? In some cases, seeing someone love somebody is more miraculous, is more healing than just seeing some other miracles. I'm not trying to categorize. I'm not trying to downsize. But am I making sense? There's some emotional wounds that go so deep. They go so deep that a little love, even a little hello, a hug, a smile, a thank you, um, I'm sorry, can go a long ways. Just being there. Just caring. So many times as I read the scriptures, I see how Jesus had compassion on the people. You know, that of compassion is a very strong witness. But then what does it have to do with the fear of the Lord? I think it has everything to do with the fear of the Lord. If you understand the context I've been talking about the fear of the Lord, it's about respecting. It's about honoring. It's about reverencing. It's about trusting God. If we're living our lives just for ourselves, if we're living our lives just for us four and no more, that's not the witness I want to be. Yes, I want to be a strong, good husband. Yes, I want to be a strong family man. But I want to be a witness. I want to see the miraculous. We need to see more. Church, we are not seeing enough. I'm going to get into some of that. But I want to be a witness. In the fear of the Lord. Am I making sense? Am I making... Uh, I, I hope you're hearing what I'm trying to say. We're not here to judge people. We're not here to judge. We're not here to be a jury. I'm not here fruit picking. I'm here to be a witness. Not just in my words. But in my demonstration of power. I know that... You might think you don't have a strong testimony. But you can give it, whatever your testimony is, you can say something along these lines. I know there's a God because He has changed my life. And this is how He did it. That's your witness. When you're on the witness stand for something, you don't, you don't pick and choose. It's not multiple choice. You just tell them what you saw. You just tell them what you heard. You're not giving your opinion. You're not giving, you're just giving all your witness to the situation. But God will use that witness. And that witness can be very powerful for a lawyer, uh, for uh, the, the, a counselor to use in the court system. He, can use, he or she can use that witness as evidence. But they need your testimony. People need to hear your story. People need to hear your witness of how you trust God. People need to hear and see your witness how you are relying on Him. People need to see your witness of the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, faithfulness, kindness, goodness. They need to see the, the fruit. They need to see the, the witness. Are you understand what I'm saying? The fruit of the Spirit and witness? People need, to, people need to see a witness of kindness. People need to see a witness of goodness. People need to see a witness of love. Long suffering. <laughs> Hopefully, I'm making the sense of this. Go with me to Acts chapter nine. <coughs> this is really a key verse that I've been trying to get to these last few weeks. Acts nine thirty one it says, and then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria. Hold your finger there. What did we just read in Acts chapter one? But you shall receive power 
When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you should be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and the other most parts of the earth. And then we read here in Acts chapter 9, and then the churches throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. They were edified because of the witness that took place of the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, I don't care how powerful the Holy Spirit moves in your life. If it, if, if it didn't change your life, if it didn't transform your life, if it didn't affect your life, then to me, I don't want power just for power. You know, I don't want just electricity in this house just so we can have electricity. I want to have electricity so we can turn the lights on, so we can record this message today. I want the power so we can use it. If there's power in this house, but there's no outlet, there's no way to plug into it. There's no source, there's no benefit, there's no fruit of it, then to me it's useless. That makes sense? And, uh, and I don't want too much power, in a sense. We don't want just enough voltage in that, in that, in that socket, in that light bulb. And that makes sense. And anyway, let me get off get back here. Then the churches throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and were edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord... And in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. You know, I've seen some very powerful things of the Holy Spirit. I've seen blind eyes open. I've seen people healed with cancer. I've seen some very miraculous things. I, we've gotten some very profound words from God. We even got one yesterday, uh, Sherry and I. It's very meaningful to us. We got a word yesterday. And it's very, very, very edifying. But you know, sometimes one of the most edifying things is not so much seeing the miraculous, and I'm not, again, I'm not watering it down, but when I see a life encouraged, when I see a life transformed, when I see a life comforted by the Holy Spirit, that's what I do. and, and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. When I see a life touched, the whole reason we do this, the whole reason we live stream, the whole reason we do everything in our Bible studies, in our Bible classes, the whole reason we went into this ministry was not to make a name for ourselves. The whole reason we did this is so people can be touched by the comfort of the Holy Spirit. So people can experience what we've experienced. I'm going to be teaching a new series once we're done with this one. I just got uh, the message or the title. Uh, I haven't put it together yet. Talking about the Garden Restored. I don't want to spoil that yet, but there's just, there's just something about, in my life, every time I've been very intimate with the good Lord. I remember times in my high school days. I remember time, very significant times in my life where I've been very close with God. I've been very intimate with God. Some people, when they pray, they see themselves in the throne room of God, or they see themselves in the presence of God, or they have their own image of what that looks like. For me... It's all the image I always have when I'm very intimate with God and I'm having a one-on-one -on -one time with God is me walking with God in the Garden of Eden. That's been always my image. Walking with Him, sometimes hand in hand, sometimes just being there, sometimes just being at His feet, sometimes just walking, sometimes just hanging out. And I don't do that enough. We, God created us for a relationship. God, the, we always, I hear a lot of people say the first relationship God created was between a man and a woman, and that's the second one. I'm all for marriage, and I believe that that was one of the very first things God instituted. But the very first thing God instituted was his own relationship with man. God had a relationship with Adam before even Eve came along. And I'm not trying to post man over woman. I'm just saying the first relationship God established was his own relationship with mankind. Walking in the cool of the evening in the, in the garden. That's the first relationship. Jesus didn't do anything without spending time with his daddy. Without spending time with the father. That, and Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. And, 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 and it's in this secret place. God created a relationship with us, but, but because of sin, man lost that relationship. But because of Jesus, we are in right relationship with God. That's what righteousness is. And we are, God has restored that garden relationship. And it's in that garden relationship. It's in that relationship. The garden is not so much significant. It's the relationship. It's, it just me and paints a picture and where it all began. It's, a, it's the genesis of all things. 
But, it, it, but we are not going to walk in the fear of the Lord, church. We are not going to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit if we're not in relationship with God. And, and I, I lost my point of where I was going here. But I see here in Acts chapter 9 verse 31 that as the churches had peace and were edified because they walked in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit that the church was multiplied. It was effective. How many of us want to reach our society? How many of us want to reach our family and our friends? We need to walk in the fear of the Lord. The early church was multiplied. Not just added. Multiplied. Do you, you, you understand? You know, I remember back in fourth grade when I was learning multiplication. Multiplication is different than addition. Four plus four is eight. But four times four is sixteen. Okay? Basic math right here. Okay? The church was multiplied. The church was effective. The church eventually, and we'll see in the book of Acts, the church turned the world upside down, or right side up, rather, because they were walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. You can't walk in the comfort of the Holy Spirit without trusting Him, without honoring Him. <coughs> and in fact, Paul says, in Ephesians chapter 4, towards the end of the chapter, he says, you grieve the Holy Spirit by how you treat one another. I don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. I don't want to frustrate the Holy Spirit because of how I treat you. I want to honor you because I honor God. I trust Him. I respect Him. I'm not living for me. I'm living for Him. God made us to be a family of koinonia. We are the body of Christ. I, I could go off on this. How we treat one another is a major, the negative part is a pet peeve of mine. It's very passionate. I'm, I'm passionate about righteousness. I'm passionate about how we treat one another. And But we are not going to treat one another if we write, if we don't understand righteousness, if we don't understand the fear of the Lord, if we don't understand the, the walking and the power of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't matter to me how many tons of miracles you do if you treat people over. I don't know if I said that right. It doesn't matter how, how powerful the gifts of the Holy Spirit are working in your life if you are treating people wrong. In my eyes, if you treat people wrong, you have just ruined your witness in my eyes. I'm turned off. But I'm not looking for profound, I'm not looking for rigid action. A lot of that glamour turns me off. I am all about the power. I am all about the gifts. I am all about getting caught up in the Holy Spirit. And we need to do that more individually and collectively. But I'm all about if we walk with God, walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, but we don't reach anybody, then me and my opinion, we have accomplished nothing. We are in this ministry. We have this gospel. We have this message. We have this inheritance. We, have, we are the light of the world. We are the salt of the earth. We have, but the Spirit of God is upon us to heal the brokenhearted and to set the captives free. Go with me to Isaiah 61. I wasn't going to go here, but I'm just, I'm, I'm, part of me is ticked off. <laughs> and I'm trying to, to choose my words wisely. Some things I've experienced even this week, even today. And how are you just getting some of the aftermath of my own unsettledness about some things, but I want to gear this energy towards the Word of God. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to be a witness. 
And what did that witness look like? To preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captive, and to open the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God, <coughs> to cover all who mourn, to console those, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the plain of the Lord, that he may be glorified. And they ra shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the ruined cities. I'm going to be talking about this in our next series about the garden restored. I'll come back to verse 4 later in a new series. But now here's the there's some, you know, a lot of times when I talk about cities, city and, and, and the prophetic, it can also talk about people, groups, families. It can also be prophetic in that way. But uh, don't get so hung up on all of that. That's just a side point. It's just, there's a lot of ruined lives out there, should people? There's a lot of devastated families out there. There's a lot of devastated people out there. They have been devastated. And a lot of that devastation has been because of how people have treated them. I want to be a part of the solution, not part of the problem. Excuse me. I want to help. And God has anointed me with His Spirit not just to do signs and wonders, and I'm, a, I'm all for that. But he has anointed me to heal the brokenhearted, to help people. I didn't sign up. I didn't, I didn't do ministry. Just to, The word minister means servant. I'm here to serve people. Not use them. I'm not just trying to pack the pews. We don't have pews. We have couches and chairs. Right now we just have a, a spot on Facebook Live. I'm not here trying to get a bunch of likes and views. I'm trying to change people's lives. God has anointed me. I know I have my flaws. I'm not perfect. None of us are. And anyone who thinks they are, you just show me you're imperfect. I'm not And I'm not here to I'm not here to pick on people. The God Church has anointed us to heal people, to touch lives. In this generation, in this society, amidst COVID and all the chaos going on in our world today. God, this God has proclaimed the sepulchre of the Lord. To cover all who mourn. To console those who mourn. I want this witness, church. In the fear of God. And the respect and honor towards God. Woe to me if I treat you any less. Because I'm self-centered. Because I'm focused on me. I understand we have to take care of our needs. I understand, I, I, you know, uh, I, 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 there's, there's a balance of things at times. But I'm sold out to this. I'm sold out. Pastor or no pastor. Take a time, pastor. I want... This still, I still want to be this. I want to serve people in practical, spiritual, and, and, and ways. When people, actually, uh, 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 go with me to Joshua. I want to continue with my thoughts, but I want to take this to another level. And I'm going to talk about a little bit of this miraculous. I'm not excluding miracles. Don't get me wrong. We, the world needs to see a miraculous God. The world needs to see a demonstration that our God is alive. And the church is powerful. Don't get me wrong, folks. I, 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 I piggyback and I zeroed in and I spent some time on how we treat one another. But that's not all it is. We need to see some powerful things. We need to see some people raised from the dead. We need to see some miracles. The, the world flocked to Jesus. Jesus hung out with the publicans and sinners. Not only did he, 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 not only did he have compassion on the multitudes because they flocked to him because he, they knew that he would change their life physically in real ways. But even the publicans and sinners knew that they, they wanted to hang out with him. You know, the world should want to hang out with us. 
I, you know, the only people who didn't want to be with Jesus were religious folks. And Jesus didn't really care much to be around them either. The only people Jesus did not want to hang out with, or people did not want anything to do with Jesus, was religious people. That tells me a lot. The publicans and sinners liked Jesus. And he, I know that when he hung out with them, he was not condoning their lifestyles. But he was also being a witness with compassion. Did he want their lives changed? Yeah, because he didn't create them for that. He didn't create them to throw their lives away and, and treat tax collectors, robbing people, stealing people, doing wrong things. But he wanted to show them his goodness. Joshua chapter 4, verses 23-24. It says, For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you have crossed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up before you before us until we had crossed over. That all the peoples of the earth may know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, and that you fear the Lord your God forever. Or I read verse 24 again. That all the people of the earth may know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, and that you may fear the Lord your God forever. God did miracles in Israel, from the Red Sea to the Jordan and beyond, that the all peoples, all peoples of the earth may know the hand of the Lord. That it is mighty, and that you may fear the Lord your God forever. I don't know about you, but I just can't read that verse enough. God, when, church, I wrote this in my notes. When people see the supernatural work of God in your life, it will cause the fear of God to come upon them. People... Not only, people need to not only hear your testimony, but they need to see God working in your life. You know, one of the things that intrigues me to people like Andrew Womack and Ross and Perdue and others, because I see God working in their lives, in their church, in their ministries. It's not fake. I know these people, I don't know them, some of them as personal as others, but. <clears throat> I see the fruit of their ministry. I know people who come from their ministry. And I see, I've seen the bad apples too. I've seen the fakes. They're there too. They can't control all of that. But there's good fruit. And like Lawson says, you can look for the, uh, everything wrong with this church and you'll find it. And you can find, look for everything right with this church and you'll find it. You choose what you're looking for. Because it's, it's both here. It will be there. We, we, can, we can go fruit picking. We can be the judge and the jury trying to find them everything wrong with the people. Or we can do what we're supposed to do, be a witness. God did not call you to be a judge of people's lives. In one sense of the word, God did not call you to change people's lives. He called you to be a witness so he could change their lives. He called you to be a witness so that they could see the hand of the Lord that is mighty, that you fear, that you trust, that you reverence, that you rely on, that you honor, respect God all the days of your life. And it might make sense. I'm not just saying there's not a time where we edify and encourage and admonish one another, but we do it as a, as a witness. We're not the judge. We're not their daddy. We have one daddy. Now God will use us in the air. Yes, all scripture is proper for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Not damnation. Not condemnation. In righteousness. So that the man of God may be fully equipped for every good work. So if you're not using the correction, the reproof, the correction for the training in righteousness, then you are mistreating the Word of God. And we've already established in this series that walking the fear of the Lord is also walking, is having a trust, a fear, a, a reverence for God's Word. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Don't lean on your own understanding. 
so many times, even in correcting others, even correcting ourselves, we lean on our own understanding. We, 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 we are wise in our own eyes. No. In the same path, in the same past, the same chapter, uh, the writer Solomon will say how you know uh, a father disciplines his child. He, but the whole chapter, if you read from the beginning of the chapter to the end, he's talking talking about mercy. God teaches us by His mercy. There's correction, and the fact that there is correction, that is mercy. You know, if a if a toddler is playing with a hot stove and you don't correct them, that's not mercy. If a child is running down the street and you don't correct them, that's not love. That's not mercy. That's not grace. I don't know. I can bring it down. But I would call that hatred. We correct people in love and compassion and righteousness. So that we can be equipped for every good work. You want to save their life. You want to help them. Am I making sense? We do it in the fear of the Lord. Not in wrath. Not in judgment. But as a witness. Uh, anyway. Going back here to Joshua. That all the people of the earth may know the hand of the Lord that is mighty. That you may fear the Lord. People need to see the work of God. We need to love and respect God more than we love and respect the approval of men. I believe one reason that there is not a greater fear of God is God's people are not manifesting His power, His glory, and His witness. Am I making sense? I'm not trying to get on our case. I'm trying to encourage us. I'm trying to help us. We should be glorifying God in such a way that it causes the fear of God to fall in if people look at your life as like, whatever you have, I don't want it. People should look at our lives like, Dad, brother, I want what you got. That should, that should be people who fun. They might not know how to get it. There may, may be part of their flesh that's resenting it because they don't want to let go of their pleasures or whatever the case may be. But they want to, sometimes we want to hold on to our depression. Sometimes we want to hold on to our anger. Sometimes we want to hold on to our sin. But we should li live in our lives in such a way that people say, I want what you got. That's the fear of God. That's the fear of God working. That's glorifying, magnifying God. That's being a witness. People should recognize that God is with us. People recognize God was with Joseph. People recognize God was with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. People recognize that God was with David. People recognize that God was with Esther. People recognize that God was with Jesus. People recognize God was with Daniel. God should, people should be able to recognize that God is with us. There's something different. Your flesh may fight against it. Zacchaeus recognized there was something different. Nicodemus found Jesus in the middle of the night and recognized there was something different about We are the light of the world. We are the salt of the earth. We are the light. When you're in darkness and you've lost your way, you head towards the light. People just shouldn't look at us and go, let's go the other way. Let's make a U-turn. Let's not go down that road. There's so many Christians that the world wants nothing to do with. I understand we've already talked about this, even in the series of the Lord. There, there, there will be those who will call good and evil and evil good, and that's getting growing in our, in our world today. It, but it was true in Paul's day. It was true in Rome. It was true in Babylon. It was true in some of these other cities and some of these Babylon and different things. That was true then too. But we need to be a witness. We're not responsible. They might stone us like Stephen. They might throw us in the fire pit like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They might throw us in prison like Joseph. They might throw us into a, a lion's den like Daniel. But we are going to fill the Lord and we are going to be a witness so we can reach the dairy sisters, so we can reach the Nebuchadnezzar, so we can reach Pharaoh and all the nations of the earth so that people can see, know that the hand of the Lord that is mighty. <coughs> we are the light of the world. We are the salt of the earth. We have 
not been standing up, some of us. We've been afraid of men more than we've been fearing God. We've not allowed our light to shine because we don't, we're afraid to speak the truth. You know, I had a job one time, and I was very adamant I don't work Sundays. I don't believe that's necessarily a law, but that was a, a law for me. And I, I, I agree with taking a Sabbath. I believe that we need to have a day off, not as a Old Testament law, but I believe we've got, I, I mean, I can talk about Sabbath. The Sabbath to me is not just a day. I mean, Jesus, God created the earth on six days. On the seventh day, he, 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 it was a Sabbath, a day of rest. But I always, I always ask people, so what did he do on the eighth day? Did he go back to work? Did he start creating again? Did he go back to work on the ninth day, the tenth day, the hundredth day? Two years from now? Fifty years from now? A couple centuries? No. The Sabbath is a lifestyle. Now, I understand there's a day where we, we celebrate that. We worship that. We, we, we give allegiance to that. And I get that. But Jesus said, God made uh, the Sabbath for man, not man for the Sabbath. I believe we need to have a day out. But I also told many of my employers, I get, I get, they go, well, can't you go to the church on Monday? I go, I could, but no one else is there. I believe the church should be open 24-7. Because the church is not a building. The world should be able to call us anytime. I get those balances out. I'm not talking about credit dependency and whatnot. The church should be open all the time in that regard. But at the same point in time, I said, but our, and I, the, the way I see the church is not just an organization. It's not a club. It's a family. I said, our family meets on Sundays. Our family has Sunday dinner every Sunday. And that's when we meet. I can go on Monday, I'll be the only one there. I can go on Tuesday, I'll be the only one there. But our Sunday, our, our family meets on Sunday. And then he asked me, uh, one, one working, well, if everyone went to church on Sunday, then no one would be working. And I was, everyone's, if everyone's at church, no one needs to be working. Because everyone's at church. Okay, open up in the afternoon. Uh, you know, it's half family dinner, barbecue, well, you know, I mean, we've done it before. We can do it again. I go, uh, I, you know, but I had another employer one time uh, that I got demoted because even though I've been in management for a few years and whatnot, I, the rules changed. I got demoted from full time in management because I would not let Sundays go. And they said, You can either be demoted or you can leave. I said, I'll, I'll take the demotion. <laughs> you know, and that, that whole thing triggered uh, me, us going into some financial problems where we lost our home and everything. But I, I was willing to do that to go, because I was going to go to church on Sunday. And even though management didn't agree with my opinion, agree with me, I had one manager who said, I respect that. Because you will stand for what you believe. If you have a good conviction about something, you're standing for it. No matter what it's going to cost you. And I don't know to this day if you ever became a believer, but he, he saw that. He respected my stand. I wasn't nasty about it. I wasn't angry about it. I didn't uh, throw a fit about it. But I stood, st I stood my ground, and I wasn't going to compromise. Uh, and so, uh, and I'm not trying to again give attention to me. I'm just like you know, we, our example, our witness, whether people agree with it or, and there can still be consequences about it. We, all, I mean, I got demoted, and, and we went in that season. We went from three full time jobs to one part time job, and we lost everything. So it wasn't just because of that. There was other things that were going on. And anyway, I could, I could piggyback on that more. But we're the light of the world. We should be a witness. But some of us have, are not willing to speak the truth. I'm not willing to make a stand. And I'm not, I don't, I would never advocate not working on Sunday more than I would advocate some other things. To me, that's not at the top of my list. But it is something I, I, I respect and honor. Does that make sense? I'm more about people's life being changed by Jesus. I am advocating this on a day. That makes sense? When a day becomes more important than the gospel, that's wrong. Now that becomes an idol. And that's different. I'm not talking about that. If I can win my brother by working Sunday, I'll do it. That makes sense. There's some days I'm willing to give. There's some days I'm not willing to give. Um, so, uh, I just want to make that side point. But even though some of us are not willing to take to the church is supposed to be not arrogant, 
not rioting, but the church is peaceful. We're supposed to say what we believe, despite if others like you. We have had a lot of people hate us for the things we believe. We have had, we're just a small church. As far as size, as far as impact in that way. But we've had a lot of, lot of, lot of, a lot of abuse because of what we stand for and what we teach. Um, let me just say this, every one of us who are born again has something the risk world does not have. I don't care how long you've been walking with God or how timid or shy you think you are or how, how uneducated you may think that you are as far as scripture is concerned about the things of God. But every, it's just the fact that you're born again, every one of us has more, something that this world does not. Your experience will conquer is greater than most arguments. People may be able to argue you scripture. They might be use, able to use apologetics and other things. To, they might have a stronger argument. They just know how to argue better. But they cannot argue away your experience. They might not like it. They might not receive it. They might not be touched by it. But your experience is your experience. That makes sense? You have a testimony. You have a witness. I mean, when, when you're in court and the, the, the opposing side, and if the lawyer is going to try to to destroy your witness, but your witness is your witness. And if it's your witness, it, it, will, it will hold. It will hold. And, then, and they're going to do their job to try to tamper, to try to, the, the, to, to, to <clears throat> find holes in it. But if it's true, if it's and then they, can, they, they can't argue the truth. They can't argue the witness. And my point is, you may not understand everything to win an argument. But you're not called to, yes, we're called to give an answer for anyone who's in. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we are. But we are called to be witnesses. To watch our lives, our doctrine, how we walk in the Lord, how we walk in the fear of the Lord. Let me just uh, bring out a couple more things. I'm going to wrap this up because I think I'm almost done. <clears throat> uh, I'm not, you don't have to turn there, but in Acts chapter 5, we have the story of Ananias and Sapphira. <clears throat> Ananias and Sapphira lied to Peter about some property. In other words, they lied to the Holy Spirit regarding some property. I'm not going to go into all that context. But if you go to Acts chapter 5 and you read the context, they will talk about how the fear of the Lord came upon people. Now, I've, had, I've heard a lot of different interpretations through the years. Some I agree, some I don't. Nah, 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 nah. That's a little stretch to me about why this happened. And this is New Testament. This is, if this is the early church, where does this happen? I've never heard of another circumstance where people just died in church. And we don't even know if this was in their church, per se. But there, was, there is something significant, in our, in our, and I'm just picking back on some things Andrew Womack says, that they lied to the Holy Spirit and great fear came on the church. Even though in one sense, in many ways, that this is a negative experience. When the power of God is demonstrated, folks, it will cause the fear of God to come on others. Am I making sense? I hope you're not losing me with this example. But even in this person, whether we agree with it, whether we like it, it happened. Whether we understand it all, it was still a demonstration of the power of God. And it caused people to reverence God. That maybe had become complacent in their reverence to God. That make sense? When people see a demonstration of the power of God, and one says for better or for worse, there is a reason for this. 
And God doesn't do anything out of anger, and in, in, in the sense that He does it out of He He's He already poured out all of His wrath on Jesus. We have to understand that, folks. At the same point in time, the Holy Spirit will not be lied to, and He will not allow His people to be mistreated. And how He does that, I, that's God doing. We're not the judge, and we are not the jury. We are witnesses. Make sense? But when the and I'm not I'm not promoting this so much, but I am promoting the power of God. And people need to start seeing the power of God. I have seen some things. I mean, there was uh, one story. I don't know if I can get it right, so I don't know if I'm making a mistake by sharing this. But there's some missionaries in some country, and they had some swords of some type. I don't know if they were machetes or whatever. They were about ready to, to monitor some missionaries. And lightning came and melted melted the, 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 the sword in their hand. And it actually melted on their hand. And I've seen, I've heard, I hadn't seen, I wasn't there. Uh, but I, I, I've heard of testimonies of how God has intervened in situations. I don't, you know, I don't know how this relates to all of that completely. I'm not going to try to do that right now. But they did see the power of God. And it did cause fear of God in a positive way to come upon the work church. People need to see. You know, <clears throat> in some ways, and in some churches, let me just say this now. There needs to be some discipline. You know, you show me a, a, bunch, of, a bunch of kids that are not being disciplined, it shows. You can, I've said this before, you can show me a hundred kids and I can tell you which of those kids are being disciplined. And which of those kids are not? And the ones who feel disciplined feel loved, and the ones who don't are not being disciplined. I'm not, God does not judge in a sense. God is not condemning people. But at the same point in time, God, I believe in discipline. And there's a proper way, there's a right way. Paul advocates that. Jesus advocates that. James advocates that. There's a proper way to di bring discipline in the church. And some churches are just like a bunch of kids that are out of control. And there needs to be some, in the right way, in the right manner, in compassion, in the fear of God, there needs to be some discipline. And when, when the house is in order, and the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. There's, there's people rejoice. You know, there have been times when I was a kid, when we had a substitute teacher, and the, the class was all riled, riled. I didn't like that. I didn't feel secure in that classroom. I didn't know how far some of the kids would go. But when the, even though some of the teachers were strict, I felt that class was in order. I felt at peace. I felt great. I'm so glad Mr. Cavanaugh's back. I'm so glad so and so's back. You know? Did I think they were a little off at times? Yeah. I can probably say about everybody, including myself. But, uh, uh, but, you know, I just, you know, I just like it when you know, I've said before, when we, as, as school age kids, sometimes we would play baseball, kickball in the, in the street, and we would argue every five minutes when, uh, no, they were out, no, they were safe. You know, we never got to enjoy a full game. And someone took their ball home because they were mad. But, but when I, I play games when there's a referee. And I might not always agree with Ump's call. But you know what? We can play the game because there is a final authority in the matter, and there are boundaries, there's rules, and uh, that ump has the last say. I've also seen games where everyone wanted to revolt against an ump, and the ump just left. The ump left, the game's over. You know, nobody wins in that case. Uh, you know, and so I would rather finish the game. Anyway, hopefully I'm making sense for some of this. Go to me and come real quick. Um, I'm going to finish with this one. Go to me to 1 Kings chapter 8. First Kings chapter 8. I'm going to pick it up verse 43. <coughs> uh, actually, I'm going to pick up verse 41 to get a little bit of context here. Moreover, concerning the foreigner who is not of your people Israel, but has come from a far country for your name's sake, but they will hear of your great name and your strong hand and your outstretched arm when he comes and prays towards this temple. They're dedicating the, the temple here, and, and God's giving some instructions. He says, Here in heaven your dwelling place. 
and do according to all for which the foreigner calls to you, that all peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do your people Israel, and they may know that this temple which I have built is called by your name. Actually, Solomon's prayer of prayer here. And there's a lot here I can take you back on. I just want to make some points. But Solomon is asking God to move among the foreigners, the non-Jews. God is asking God to move in the foreigners. To me, the parallel of that today is God, would be the Lord answering the prayers of those who are not Christians. Paul, Solomon is asking for those who are not their people. And there's been so many times I, I've prayed for people to for God to answer their prayers. There was one guy, <coughs> we were visiting a church with Sherry and I had lost, lost everything in 2009, 2013. And we walked to a nearby church. We, it wasn't the best church, but it was, it was a church we were at for a while, so we were faithful in attending. I went to a men's prayer breakfast one morning, and as we were leaving and exiting the parking lot, a man, a man that I want to call a druggie, he could tell he's from the world, he was, I mean, he could have been a high or something, I don't know. But he came and you could tell that he was asking for prayer, but now you could also tell none of the church, none of the religious people were in an interview with him. And I'm not saying he, those people are the best to be around myself, but this guy's coming to the church. And maybe he's looking for a handout, I don't know, but he's coming to the church. He's looking for help. The right or wrong, and maybe he doesn't have it all together. He's, he, of course he's not. He's not a believer. He, I don't expect him to have it together yet. But he's looking for a handout, but he has some prayer requests. He wanted to pray for his mom who was really sick, and he, someone had stole his bike, and uh, another request, I don't know what that was. And so I just felt, I said, can we, can we pray for you? The guys were trying to shove him away, and I asked if we could pray for him. And I prayed very specifically for him. I prayed that God would heal his mom, and I prayed even, I don't pray this way a lot, but I prayed in very specific prayer. I said, Lord, I pray that you would heal his mom this way. And I pray that you would, he would find his bike, and I, I pray a very specific manner how you receive his bike, that this way I, I ended the prayer so that this man would know that there is a God that loves him and, and that has done this just for him. And a, a week or so went by, he came on a Sunday morning in the middle of church, where we were meeting, meeting, I think it was at the end of church I saw him, and he found me, he goes, Dude! You'll never believe it! Actually, I think you will, because you prayed it, but he says, my mom got healed exactly how you're praying. And my bike got returned to me exactly how you're praying. But I want, I want to talk to you more. Well, I'm going to go find those other guys because they didn't seem to believe like you did. I want to go tell them. <clears throat> this guy saw the fear of God. <clears throat> and it's like Solomon praying for these foreigners. I believe sometimes we need to sometimes pray the loss, to see a manifestation of the power of God. So they can believe God. I believe sometimes God works in miraculous ways for everyone who, in other words, let me just say this way. God believes, works, God, God, Jesus, God says that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And I believe there's times where God will use miracles to draw people to his goodness so that they may know him and walk in the fear of the Lord themselves. My point is, we need to be showing the fear of God to people with compassion. We don't need to be pushing people away. I get it when people take advantage of us or, or it becomes codependency and that's a whole, totally different issue entirely. But if we're so busy with our religiosity that we don't take time for people, to me, something is majorly wrong. Paul calls that adultery. Paul, Paul calls when we're so stubborn. He calls that idolatry because we are serving ourselves and not God. And I get it, we need to care of our families. I, need it, I get it, that we need time for ourselves. But God didn't redeem me for me. God redeemed me by his blood that I might be a king and a priest in all the earth. That makes sense? That makes sense? I have more to share, but I'm going to save this for next week. Um, I'm out of time for the day. Um, but uh, anyway, Lord, I just, we just worship you. Lord, I don't know how much I communicated this, this morning, but Lord, I want to see your power working in my life. Lord, your spirit has anointed us to bring 
life in wholeness to others. Help us to walk in the fear in such a way that we minister to others. In your name we give you thanks. God bless you. We'll see you next week. Uh, God bless you. Bye-bye.